like my life has been spared nine times. And suddenly a disc appeared in the air and then it began to expand and it got to be about six to eight feet across. You met with uh, aliens, is it true? Yes, that's very true, many times. Can you please explain uh, like how the aliens look like? Welcome to our podcast, Byron. I hope you are doing well. And uh, let me tell you to my audience about you. Uh, like you are a big uh, musician. You are a author. You are a uh, artist. And you have uh, met with aliens as well. So you have good knowledge about aliens as well. So please, uh, you know, welcome. And thank you so much for coming on this show. Okay. Please tell to our audience more about you. Well, thank you for having me on this show and giving me the opportunity to talk with people. I really appreciate that. I'm uh, 73 years old. I have been visited by aliens since I was six years old. The first time was in 1956. I have a degree in English. I wanted to be a writer, but I ended up giving that up after I got my degree and got into art. And I have a master's degree in art and an MFA in art. And uh, I was in school band, but I played clarinet and I hated the clarinet parts. So I started playing the trumpet part by ear and nobody ever knew. So I got away with it. So I was last chair clarinet, though, because I couldn't pass the tests for getting higher than that. And uh, interestingly, all my music that I produce now, I write by ear. I don't know how to play keyboards, except I know where middle C is. Um, I live out. Great. So uh, you said... Uh, you met with uh, aliens. Is it true? Yes, that's very true. Many times. More. Okay. Can you please can you please tell to our audience when you first time met with them and when you last time met and what was the experience and everything? Okay. And I saw uh, some of the proofs. You claim that uh, these are. Uh, like uh, I, uh, you, I can see on your books and somewhere, okay, that you have some proofs that um, they uh, they touch on your neck or something, right? You have some pictures of that. I will uh, add here on this show, okay. So, can you please tell uh, to our audience about when you first time met with aliens and what was the experience actually? meeting with aliens it, it was in 1956 and we had just moved to Seagaville Texas uh, because my father had gotten a job at the prison as a prison guard and my mother would always take me into the bedroom and put me to bed and she would ask me if I wanted the hall light on and I would usually say yes and she would tuck me in and leave the room well one night she did all of that and then she left the room and I turned around to lay back down and go to sleep because I had watched her leave the room and there were three little men standing at the foot of my bed on the side and they were just I could see their heads above the mattress and they had huge heads and I screamed for my mother because this was 
I couldn't figure out how these little guys had gotten in my bedroom. And she came in, and I was watching the door, waiting for her to come in. She came fast. I told her what had happened, and she just didn't say anything about it. She told me I needed to go back to sleep, and she tucked me in, and she left the room. And I lay back down, and I went to sleep. The next night, the exact same thing happened exactly the same way the third night she came in and she sat down on the bed and she said son if these people come in no, if these guys come in here don't call me because they're going to be gone when I get back in here so you're just going to have to learn to deal with them yourself that's all she said she didn't say it was a dream or anything she acted like they were real and uh, she, okay. she left the room she asked me if I wanted the light in the hall on I said yes she left the room I turned around and this time they were back and there was also a, a being that was about seven feet tall standing over to my left but near the wall in the shadows and to me, he looked like Captain Hook from Peter Pan, which was my favorite book at that time. And uh, he, had a, he looked like he had a big hat on, but I realized when I started investigating all this stuff that that was his head. And he looked like he had a vest on, but I couldn't see his legs or anything. And I realized that that was a robe because he was actually a mantis creature, but I didn't know it at that time. Well, all of a sudden, I couldn't move. It was like I was tied down, even though I wasn't. And the, begin, the bed began to rotate very slowly, and the walls of the room moved outward. And the little three guys stayed like they were glued to the bed. So, actually, what was happening was I was in a ship, but they were affecting my perceptions where I couldn't tell that I was in a ship, so they didn't want to scare me too much. Well, I was just about to freak out about not being able to move, mostly. And, in fact, today I'm very claustrophobic and have been all my life. They, um, they just disappeared. The room went back to the right shape. The bed quit moving. They were gone, and I can move. And for a moment, I laid there and wondered if, if that had been a dream, but I knew I was awake, and I knew my mother had talked about them. So I pulled the cover over my head, because even though they didn't frighten me, they were so unusual that I did not want to see them ever again if they came back. And uh, that was the end of that episode. So how, how they uh, look like, uh, what was the color of them and the heights and everything? Can you please explain uh, like how the aliens look like? They were about four feet tall. And mostly all I could see was their and heads. The color? Well, it was in the dark, so I don't know for sure what color they were. They looked gray, but there wasn't a bunch of light. It was the light coming in from the hallway and they had really huge eyes. Now one of them, his features kept changing. For a minute he would look like everything was stitched on like on a rag doll. Then it would go back to normal. Then it would change again. And now from what I know, either he or the tall being was trying to affect my perceptions so that I didn't see them as they really were. Okay, so uh, did they harm you? Did, did they something like uh, talk with you or anything like that? No, it was just what I said. Or they just uh, only experienced being tied down or paralyzed. Okay. There were no, there were no things tying me down. I just couldn't move. Wow. So you, you you was scared or you was just feeling normal when you saw them? I wasn't scared, but I was confused. 
I was very confused. I didn't know what they were. I didn't know how they could be in my room. Um, I had never heard of aliens. We didn't even have a television set. Oh, okay. So after after that, when uh, when did you saw them again? The next time I saw them was around 2000 and um, uh, 2013, 2013. I'm not positive about the date. I I had a friend that okay. Really strange things have happened to me all of my life. Like my life has been spared nine times from car accidents, uh, from cancer. When I was a child, I had cancer at two and a half, a sarcoma that most people died from. Um, different accidents, things like that. And everybody would always say that God had spared my life for some special reason or that angels were looking after me. They always uh, related to it as God, angels, spirit helpers, when spirit helpers became more popular. And um, I never knew what was causing this. And I would always find marks, um, bruises. I remember once when I was around 11, I would keep waking up and I would have no clothes on. And my clothes would be on the floor, like you know, my pajamas, like I had just stepped out of them, you know, and left them there on the floor. So at that point, I started sleeping without clothes because I thought apparently I didn't want to wear clothes. I know that's odd logic, but that's the way I thought. About all these, uh, like, you can claim that they were a real alien or it was not any dream. If you have, like, any proof or anything you want to show to the people, to the world, I you can share with me. I have some pictures and some information I will add here, okay? And uh, if you have any anything else, you can let me know. Okay, I just want to show to the world. Okay, so uh, did you talk about this alien thing to anybody uh, apart from the family with any um, like any scientist or anyone that you uh, you saw the aliens you met this alien? Okay, did you talk about this with anybody apart from the family? After I found out in two thousand. And uh, let me look at my book. I don't remember when I found out. After I found out, I talked to two investigators of alien abductions. And I also showed them the pictures of the marks that I had. And I told them the narratives of my stories. And they, Daryl Sims, the alien hunter, was one of them. So what they said? Well, they said it's exactly like what other people had experienced. Anyway, I told my friend... And who was that? that? Who was that person you told? I don't use his name. I call him Frank in my book. Okay. The one that I, before oh, okay. I knew what was going on. And he uh, investigated paranormal things. This was when we didn't have computers. You had to use books for that. And um, so you wrote a book on it, on this incident. No, you wrote a it's, book. There's the book is like huge. There's everything that's ever happened to me is in this book. I one day I is was your book. Who wrote this book? I wrote it. Okay, you yeah, that's what I'm asking. Okay, so you wrote it. What, show me again. What is the name of uh, this it's book? Called, I will just share. It's backwards. It's called Chosen Chronicles of an Alien Abductee. Okay, so everything happened with you. You mentioned and wrote everything in this book about this. Can you please 
tell a little bit summary about your book so people uh, can uh, get this book if they're interested in all this tell a summary what exactly in this book is the summary well, first, not everything you can just tell first first let me tell you how i realized i was an abductee i was sitting at a stoplight going home from dinner in front of Walmart on the main street going through our town. And suddenly a disc appeared in the air at the end of the street light, the stoplight. And then it began to okay. expand and it got to be about six to eight feet across. And it looked like a uh, swirling water and I looked around at all the people at the stoplight and nobody saw it but me. I could tell that. I closed my eyes and it disappeared. I, I mean, I couldn't see it. I opened my eyes, it was still exactly where it was. Then as the light changed, it exploded into water, only it wasn't water. And it was gone by the time it hit the floor. I mean, the ground. By the time it hit the street, it was gone. So I told my friend about this and he didn't say anything. A week later on the same day at the same time, the exact same thing happened. And I told him about it again and he didn't say anything. We went for a walk for exercise and came back to his house and I told him what I had seen. And I asked him what he thought of it. And he said, do you really want to know what I think? And I said, yes, I do. He said, are you sure? I said, yes, I'm sure. And he said, I think you're an abductee. And I said, I think you're crazy. And he wrote down two web addresses and he told me to look at them when I got home. So I looked at the two web addresses after a week because I just didn't care about it. Can you hear me talking? Yeah, I can hear you very well. Okay. I can hear you. I'm sorry. I'm listening. Um, I'm listening. Actually, everything, whatever you are saying, I'm just listening and I'm, you know, trying to imagine that scene. Well, I looked on the web addresses. I looked at the websites finally after he bugged me for a week to do it. And they each had like 99 questions. And they said, if you answered 80% of them, yes. And I don't remember what they were at this particular point. If you ask, answered 87% correct, yes, then you were probably an abductee. Well, okay. all of them, I answered yes, except the three or four that were only for women. And um, I also found a thing about PTSD on there, and I'd never heard of it. But I went and checked that out, and I realized I'd had PTSD for most of my life. So at that point started walking every day well I thought about it and I knew I probably had implants and they could probably read my mind because they have uh, always saved my life at the last minute the few times they've done that who, so who saved I, your life Alien? yes who okay and how they how they saved uh, your life I was driving in my car not too many years ago, just a couple of years ago, and I was on the highway and I was in a hurry to get home. And uh, I passed by this side road that would have taken me home a different way, but it was slow, a bad road, full of potholes. So I got on the highway and I got up to 75 miles an hour, which is the speed limit. And I was about to pass this truck when it pulled in front of me because it was passing the car in front of it. So I just, I let it do that. It passed the car and then I sped up to 75 again. I was right next to it and I realized it was coming into my lane. So I didn't know what was wrong because I knew he knew I was there. He had seen me try to pass him and I pulled over into the center lane, the turn lane and um, he was still coming towards me and from the length of his truck, I knew that I couldn't slow down because the back of his truck would hit me. 
So I jammed on the gasoline and got up to 77 miles an hour. And we were going up a hill and it was pitch black. I couldn't see anything. There was no moon. There was cloudy like now. And uh, there might have been a moon, but you couldn't see it. And there are no street lights on backcountry roads, the highway even. So he's coming towards me and I jam my foot down on the gas and I get up to 77 miles an hour to pass him. And at that point, we both get to the top of the hill and I see this black line floating in the air about 45 to 50 feet away from me. And I'm going, what is that? And I, and I, I didn't slow down. I didn't think about that. I was just trying to figure out what I was seeing. And then suddenly I realized it was the flatbed of a truck that was stalled and completely blocking the highway. So at that point, I slammed on my brakes. In fact, I stood up on them to try and stop, but it has anti-lock brakes so they wouldn't lock up and it just kept going on and off and I was slowing down and the truck was slowing down, but it wasn't enough to matter. And suddenly I was about 20 feet from the truck when the truck next to me hit it right over its back tires and parts of his truck flew across in front of me and um, like the headlight, different things, and a few pieces of wood fell off of the trailer. And I look down and I'm, I'm still going 60 miles an hour and I've got 20 feet to go. And I said to him, I said, are you guys actually going to let me die this time? And my car immediately slowed down to zero and I was about 10 feet from that truck and he had already impacted it and nothing in the seat next to me flew around I didn't swing forward there was no inertial force inside of my truck at all and my top hat had been laying on the seat next to me and I've had it fly into the floorboard just stopping for a stoplight regularly so the only place I've ever heard of that occurring is in stories about UFOs and the fact that they can turn real fast, faster than we can. They can stop instantly. So they had slowed down my truck to keep me from hitting. And I called 911 to tell them there had been an accident, which it wasn't me. And they said they already knew about it. And I realized that they knew about the other side of the truck. There had obviously been someone else that hit it. So I went home. The next day, I went back to look at the area and to measure the distance. And it was 50 feet. And what had happened is four or five train wheels and axles for the train cars had been were being carried on that truck and somehow had dumped when the the guy was apparently making a turn and couldn't do it everything had dumped into the highway so that's why the truck driver when he saw that he had started coming into my lane and he could see over the hills sooner than i could so there's no way the next day also i went to the automobile place to have something done to my car and i said to that guy what had happened and he said, he, he looked, he stood there and looked at me a minute. And then he went, well, that was a miracle. He said, that, that was a miracle. miracle and yes. I found out to stop my truck at that speed would take 350 feet. I looked on the website for the Texas Department of Highways. And it had that information. 350 feet to stop a truck going 77 miles an hour. Now, one other event that happened in 1961, well, okay. first off, let me tell you about what happened with my father. Uh -huh. And this is more, more that they knew about these guys. This was uh, six years, well, 56, 57, 58, 9, five years after my first event. Uh, was in bed and this song 
had just become popular in the United States, and I liked it and listened to it. And it was called, Does Your Chewing Gum Lose Its Flavor on the Bedpost Overnight? And it was popular first in England. And it started playing in my head over and over and over and over and over again. And I could not sleep all night long. And mother came in to get me to get ready for breakfast and to go to school. And I, I got up and I went in there and I told her what had happened and that I couldn't go to school because I hadn't slept any. And I asked her what, what that was, why that song kept playing. And she said, she didn't know. And then, and it was like, don't ask me anymore. But she didn't say that. I just knew not to ask anymore. And she took me into the living room and sat me on the sofa. And she said, I'm going to have you watch TV, watch cartoons all day. Do not go to sleep because you're going to go to sleep tonight and you're going to go to school tomorrow. And then she went into the dining room and she got the phone off the wall and took it into the kitchen and she had a conversation with somebody I couldn't hear. Then my father got home at four o'clock after I'd watched TV and drank caffeinated soft drinks all day. She, uh, he came in, he didn't even say hello to me. He just walked right by me, took my mother by the hand and led her into the kitchen and they had a discussion. And then he came in and sat down on the sofa by me and he said, son, if you don't straighten up, we're going to have to take you to a psychiatrist. And I'm going, what? I didn't say that, but I'm going, what the hell? This was just a song playing in my head. And, uh, and interestingly, I was watching a show that had psychiatrists in it at that point in time, a soap opera. He said, we Lacey's don't talk about ourselves to anyone. Unless I was with my parents, I did not know anything that happened to them. And you don't talk to yourself to anyone. And he said, he said that several times. And he said, and you don't want to be famous. You don't want people to know who you are. You don't want any of that. And I didn't know where that was coming from either. So then he said, um, in the late 1800s, a female ancestor of yours told people that little men came into her room at night and talked to her. And they put her in an insane asylum where she died. And you don't want that to happen to you. Now, I wasn't even thinking about the little guys. I hadn't thought about them for years and I didn't think about them then, but obviously they were on his mind and he remembered completely because why would he be saying that about the little guys coming into our, my relatives, my ancestors room. Right. So later I realized he knew about the aliens. And when I found out, I was an abductee. I went to a uh, Whitley Strieber event, Dreamland Festival, where they had several people involved with UFOs talking and a um, Marla Freeze, who is a psychic medium, and she's worked with police. There was a show, The Medium, and she was the technical advisor on that show. Well, she was going to be there. So I took a picture of my father and for the first time I sat on the front row somewhere instead of way back at the back, which was my habit. And she was going to read for three people. And the first one, a woman got it. The second one, she picked me because I was, ah. and I handed her the picture of my father and she said, Oh, you came prepared and nobody else had done that. Cause I knew they were, used pictures where well, she didn't look at it, but she put it against her thigh, the front of her thigh and she fell down. And she said that my father pushed her to show me that it was something to do with the way he died. And I said, yes, he fell down and broke his hip. They operated on him. He wouldn't let them give him the decoagulation shot. And the next day, 
a blood clot let go and went to his heart and killed him. So anyway, she knew how he died. And she told me that I was a fourth generation abductee, that three generations of my family had been abducted, that my father had been abducted. And uh, that's why he was telling me not to talk about him, because in 1961, people would think you were crazy. You would lose your job. All kinds of bad things would happen to you. It wasn't like now. And um, so that's part of the way I know I'm up. And that's what led wow. me to contact. When I got home, I contacted Daryl Sims, the alien hunter in Houston. And we started communicating. And uh, I ended up also emailing I can't remember her name right now her grand her grandparents were the first people mm -hmm. that uh, made it popular that they were abducted a man and a woman a black man and a white woman they were married okay. so both of them I sent them pictures I hadn't photographed my wounds or bruises or anything and Daryl talked me into photographing them and I had to fight it because there was this thing in my mind keeping me from photographing these wounds. When, when I was first married, my wife said about a bruise, I woke up and I had another bruise and she said, you hurt yourself while you're asleep more than anybody I've ever heard of because they would come at night, of course. And they leave punctures. I think I sent you some pictures of them. Punctures and bruises is most what they will do. And an, another psychic tell me that the punctures are actually um, inoculations to keep me from being made sick by the other humans that would be on the ship when I was there. Okay. Okay. Now, there's another event that happened in 1961 where my life was saved. I was riding my bicycle home from school. Okay, that was your second event happened when aliens saved your life. You're talking about, right? Second event. Well, now that was in the same year, 1961. The truck had Please tell. was just a few years ago. Well, in 1961, okay. after my father had told me that about the little men, but I still didn't understand that I was an abductee. I still didn't know what it was. I didn't think about them. I was riding my bicycle home from school with several other kids, and we were all in a row riding down the road when I said, and suddenly noticed that the car in the other lane coming towards me was coming across the yellow line and it was heading straight for me and i didn't know what to do i couldn't slow down i didn't have time to think and then all of a sudden i was on the ground and i was rolling and i would roll back and i would see the tire the bumper the street uh the light and the sky and then that happened again the tire the bumper the light and the sky and i couldn't move which is a good thing because i probably would have caused myself to be hit but after the third rotation my body straightened out and i flew between the top and the second wires of a barbed wire fence and i got a small cut in my arm uh, just a few years ago, a man in Nacogdoches was thrown through a barbed wire fence, thrown out of his car, and he looked like he'd been through a cheese grater, and it killed him. Well, they took me to the hospital, even though I said there was nothing wrong with me. And the doctor checked me out, and they gave me a tetanus shot, and then he said he wanted me to spend the night because I could have injuries that I didn't know about. So I spent the night and it was my teacher's husband who had hit me. And uh, 
Well, anyway, that teacher's he, husband. Yes. Why? Why? He was the one driving the car. And he was probably going to the school to pick her up. Well, anyway, um, okay. dad came that night and he said, well, they have bought you a new bicycle. And I said, and I don't, what do I have a new bicycle for? I don't need a new bicycle. I've got a bicycle. I mean, bicycles in 1961 were made out of steel. They weren't aluminum. They, you know, they didn't break. They were solid. They were heavy. So uh, he said, well, they bought you one. And then the next day, he can't, they came to pick me up because they were releasing me, and it was about 10 or 11. And he said, well, we, we've got your new, new bicycle. And I said, I, I don't want a new bicycle. I love my bicycle. And he said, just wait till we get home. So we got home, and there was in the front on my porch in the front of the house was a brand new red and white American flyer. It had a street, it had a light, it had a pump for riding extra people on, it had streamers coming out. Of, I mean, it was the whole Cadillac bicycle. And I said, we're looking at it, and I said, well, now I've got two bicycles. And he just goes, come with me. So he walks me around to the side of the house under the carport, and there is my bike leaning against the wall. And it is curved. If you had looked at it from above, it would be like this. And the I, I laid it down, and the seat was about two feet off of the ground where it should have been touching the ground. So the, the impact on the bicycle had been where I was sitting, except I didn't experience it. I didn't even know it had happened. I thought my bike was fine. I was fine. If it had hit me like that, it would have broken my pelvis or my leg. You know, it would have done big damage to to bend that steel bicycle like that. So that was the second time that something my father said that it was a miracle. And he doesn't he didn't usually say anything like that. He didn't say things were miracles. And everybody else, okay. God had saved. Cool. Wow, I'm surprised that these things happen actually. And I can see some of your art, uh, some of the art behind you. You made all these arts? Yes. The wooden art I can see. Can you see it? So what, what, what type of arts? Do you need? Yeah, I can see better. Great. Can you tell me uh, what type of arts you make, uh, all, all types of art, like the wooden or uh, what else? Please tell me about your art journey and uh, what art you can create. I, I didn't start doing art until I was in college, until I had almost finished my English degree. And I, sw I was a psychology major and I saw it was going to take too much time and take away from writing. So I um, switched to art because I thought it would be easy. I had done one painting in high school mm -hmm. and I had been on a field trip because I was in the art club to the museum and I went to the museum in Dallas and I thought, I, I can do this stuff. And of course it was coming from ignorance thinking that anyway, I started doing a major and um, like I didn't even know what the color wheel was when I got my two degrees. I didn't know anything about artists or art, but I was making A's because I was very creative. And after I got out of college, I worked in modern art and primitive art. I've yeah. had galleries that were selling my modern art paintings which are evolved from paper to copper. I was doing sand and okay. paper paintings. I could actually sand with an electric sander and remove paint from paper and not tear it up. 
and uh, of course the copper is easier and you go straight through some places. Would you like to see a piece? Yeah, please show me some of your uh, piece of art. I would, would like to see. Now this piece is on brass. Okay, on brass. And when you hang it on the wall, okay. when you hang it on the wall, it straightens out more. Okay. Brass is a nice gold color. I like brass, but it doesn't bend very easily. And um, so it's how, not... How you make it? How you make brass? Like with hammer or like how, how you how you make it? Well, I I started out using two two by fours and laying one on it and standing on it and bending the metal by hand and then hammering it with a rubber mallet so it didn't uh, put if you used a hammer it put these round marks in it so I would use a rubber mallet and bend it and then at some points I would go ahead and use a hammer. If I needed a real sharp bend, eventually I got a, a metal break, which allows you to bend the whole length of the metal at once. And uh, I like that a lot more. Of course, you have to straighten it out. And then you have to hammer it to get it to lay flat because it wants to stay totally bent. After that, I put gesso. The first thing you do is you sand the metal so that it has a tooth and it can hold paint. Then I would gesso okay. the, the metal with white paint and then draw on it with oil crayons and then put spray paint on it and then start removing it with a sander, an electric sander on a drill. And I call this method subtractivism. That's what I call my paintings because you subtract to get what you want. Now this piece that I'm going to show you is on tin which is a nice silver metal. Okay. And tin is difficult to bend. But aluminum is worse. I tried aluminum for a few paintings, but it will tend to the areas between will sort of curve instead of laying down more flat. So it's more difficult to work with. Okay, I think these designs are the old old design. Do you make new designs like uh, the twenties? Uh, well, actually, you... the last one I showed you is fairly new, and that's okay. where okay. I'm okay. taking off from. Here's another one that's fairly new, and I've added uh, the sphere, wooden spheres to these. Okay. The first thing I do is draw on them with oil crayons, okay. and then I spray with spray paint, spray enamel. So they look sort of like like cloisonne. Oh. This kind of, uh, this type of art, actually. I saw paintings, but I never, uh, never saw uh, the art like this, the brass and uh, on the art you have. First time I'm seeing this type of thing now those oh. black the wooden those are wooden cubes and you can adjust them to be different heights uh right now i just have them all set at at the same level so this piece can be changed because every time you change the height of one of those cubes of color the wooden cubes then you have a different painting that's interesting and why why you don't sell these arts or you just make these for yourself well until covid hit i was in galleries i was in a gallery in philadelphia a gallery in dallas and a gallery in new orleans and in new orleans i sold primitive art like the, like the ballerina, um, only smaller. Okay. This okay. I made after COVID hit. Well, any other thing? It's made with pine. Are you made wooden? Okay. Uh, the thing I like about this is the, and I'll show you closer. The, the the support is part of the sculpture. 
usually you know you make the sculpture and hook it to a support like this board is her head and her back oh okay you got you and i made her face where she could look oh okay <laughs> nice and what about the second one the second art uh the lady with a uh, violin with a um, cello okay nice They're actually pretty heavy. I can feel that these are heavy. When when COVID hit, they closed down Texas. They closed down restaurants, okay. bars. They didn't want you to go anywhere except the grocery store, basically. And I didn't want to go anywhere because I didn't want to get sick. So I only went and bought groceries. At the same time, one of the one of the galleries I was in, in the one in New Zealand, in New Orleans, the couple that owned it got a divorce. That gallery closed down. Plus, um, New Orleans wasn't getting very much business. It's an international city and nobody was coming there because of COVID. The one in Philadelphia, that lady decided to just retire. So she sold the gallery. And uh, also, I wasn't going anywhere. And to move art around, you either have to ship it or carry it. And if you're moving a whole bunch, you pretty much have to just put it in the truck and carry it. So I quit doing that. And I didn't even go to my studio very much because my house was full of art. So I had no motivation for making any because I realized my house was just, I can be very prolific. Like I can do one of these metal paintings in three days. You can imagine in a month you get 10 paintings on the walls and then right. 10 more and then 10 more. And um, I would have been drowning in art. Like my house yeah, is I can full. see lots of art behind me. And you as well, I can see a painting. Did you make that painting behind you? Yes, I made everything in here. Wall. Oh, okay. The one behind me. Okay. And I saw you make a um, digital painting also, like artificial intelligence painting. That's what that Art. is. Mm -hmm. And here's one. Do you have any? This is uh, why. And it's about the moon, which would put it in space. Uh, old house very old your ancestors and then this woman with a distraught look on her face and okay, i have so another you made this by ai made, you made it, made it by AI. Photoshop. oh photoshop okay photoshop. because that was all there was pretty much right at that time there were a few other uh programs but they weren't very good this uses the same woman, and this one says why, and above the H, you can see the UFO. Okay. Right here. Yeah, I can see that. Okay. This was a friend of mine that modeled for me, and she was a great model, even though she'd never done it professionally. But her parents had taken hundreds or thousands of pictures of her. So she just knew how to pose. Mm -hmm. okay. The painting I mean, behind you are multi talented. And uh, again, we talk about your book, we talk about your art and about aliens. Uh, I hear you, you are a musician also, right? How do you make music? This is one of my rec my album covers. Look, you're gone. Can you hear me? Oh. 
Okay. So you were saying something. Okay. On the network, there was some network problem from your side, maybe, or maybe from my side. Okay. So uh, I was asking you about your music, like how you make music and like how you, uh, who inspired you to be a musician. I, I hear your music on Apple TV, or, uh, sorry, Apple Music, on Spotify. You are everywhere. Have uh, good music also there. Can you tell me who inspired you uh, to be a musician? Or you just feel that you should make music? Please tell me about your music. Mm -hmm. I was meditating one day and I was listening to a CD that was from a commercial company okay. that had entrainment sounds in it to help you get into different states of deeper states of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And I had listened to mm -hmm. it over 300 times. I knew I, it was ambient and random, but I knew most of it in my mind. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I was listening to this and I had gotten into a deep state of meditation mm -hmm. when suddenly this music started playing that I had never heard before. It was coming through my headphones. It was coming off of the CD uh, and it was like random things and it had some strange kind of order to it that I can't explain. Um, and it did use voices like in a regular orchestra, but like in no way I've ever heard before. The closest to it would be Bartok, but he didn't do anything like this either. So, I, I listened to it and I, I knew who was playing it. The aliens were the only ones that could change the music playing through my headphones. So for about a year, I kept thinking about this music and wishing I could play it or how I would play it. I couldn't figure that out. And one day my email came on and I got an advertisement for buying a synthesizer. Mm -hmm. Uh, which was strange. I mean, stuff comes on that you've looked for, but nothing just out of the blue that you've never looked for. Mm -hmm. So I, I bought the synthesizer. It was a low price one. I could afford it. I got it. And then I started practicing with it. Now I don't know how to play keyboards, but I know where middle C is. So, and I can count C, D, E, F, G or whatever up and down and make at least make the notes in the same key. And sometimes I make them in different keys, but on purpose. Okay. A friend of mine that told me how to play bass said that there are no wrong notes. There are just notes that are difficult to resolve. Mm -hmm. In other words, they're wrong. Yeah. notes. Are you, well, mm, I, are you a singer also? Sorry. Uh, if I, okay. Are you a singer also? I, yes. I sang in high school. I had a, a rock band in high school okay. and I sang in it. And uh, then with the friend that told me how to play bass, he was in a band and they would let me sing three songs a night and it was country Western music. Okay. Okay. So um, do, do you have like interest in politics also? I ask this question to every uh, every guest. You have interest in politics. I had no interest in politics until Donald Trump became president. You you don't like Donald Trump? No, I don't like him okay. at all. Who is? He's a racist. He's a bigot. He's a liar. He's a thief. He's got 97 counts against him right now or more. The day he was elected and nobody thought he would be elected. The, the day he was elected, I got up and I heard that on the news real quick. And I'm going, oh my God. And this voice, which was the aliens, they talked in my head and they said, uh, don't worry. It won't be as bad as you think. 
And then there was a pause. And then they said, prison. And I knew that they were telling me he was going to end up going to prison. Well, anyway, I hated everything who, he did, pretty much. Who, who, who is your favorite president till now? Till now? Mm -hmm. My favorite president was John F. Kennedy. Oh, okay. John F. Kennedy, I think. Was uh, what was the year when he was president of United States? Do you remember? Sixty something. It had to be around sixty nine. Mm -hmm. You know, a little before, a little after. Okay. He he was the last dynamic president we ever had. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, do do you hear what exactly going on in the world? like the war between the countries do are you aware about that do, do you watch news or world? no i don't watch the news i catch a little bit of it on facebook i know we were in, having big problems in the middle east as usual uh -huh. and in israel uh, yeah in israel and hamas okay and you hear about Russia, Russia and uh, Ukraine war. Yes. So two wars are going on still. Okay. And the Ukraine. So uh, you, you said you are 72 year old. So uh, did you saw the world, any world war when you was a kid? World War. No, I was born. Oh, I was born after World War Two. I was born in 1950. Oh, okay. Uh, I want you to give a positive message to the audience, okay, who is watching this video before you leave the session. Please give a positive message to everyone, okay. Uh, as per your experience, okay, give uh, something which they can relate with, something positive. time and it just did a countdown uh, I think that they're here to help us and if you'd like to read more about it, my experiences my book is chosen chronicles of an alien abductee and it is on amazon.com and my music is I have like 12 14 CDs there on amazon.com also and they're on every streaming service and place where you can buy music over a hundred places. Okay. The best way to find it is just. I will share the link. Of, I will share the link of all of your work in the description. So people who will be interested uh, in your book or in your music or curious about uh, your art. Okay they can go and they can get sounds from good here. okay all right so thank you so much for your time and uh, work you know uh, for this uh, great conversation today well, thank I you for a lot from you thank you for having me thank you so much bye bye for now